Concerning the economically unstable times that we live in, it is a great idea to convert some of your savings into real money. Now, there is a big difference between real money and what we call money, which is actually just currency. So our dollar is currency, which fluctuates. Real money, on the other hand, like silver, for example, is a store of value over time. The best way to think of it is like this. If you had saved $1,000 in cash back in the late 60s, the late 1960s, that $1,000 would still be $1,000 technically, but it would buy you significantly less today due to inflation. Now, if you had saved that same $1,000 in silver, back in the 1960s, today it would be worth around $28,000. So one of the best ways to protect your purchasing power is in real money, more specifically silver. You can buy and have the metal shipped discreetly to your door, and what most people don't know is that you can actually convert your IRA or even a 401k into physical silver rather than having all of your life savings tied up in the paper fiat system which is subject to hyperinflation. Go to dailyrenegade.com and click on the Cornerstone Assets Metals banner. This is the only company that I personally trust with this kind of thing. Click on that and sign up to get your free silver report today. One of the financial experts will speak with you to find out the best way to protect your savings going forward in these uncertain times. Hello and welcome to The Sharpening Report. I am your host, Josh Peck. Tonight we have a very special returning guest, Dr. Ken Johnson, to talk about his most recent release, The New Covenant of Damascus, The Damascus Document, Community Rule, 4Q Instruction, and Related Material. Welcome back to the show, Ken. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks you for ha thanks for having me back. Oh yeah, anytime, anytime. Uh, you're, one, you're one of my favorite guests. Uh, since your last appearance, we've had uh, some new subscribers join up. So in case somebody is brand new to this uh, this topic, can you just give us like a brief rundown of who the Essenes are and what are the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah, basically uh, the Essenes are the Zadok priests uh, that we see from the Old Testament, the descendants of Aaron, and uh, they were supposed to be the priests. And in time, an apostasy hit, and you've got Sadducees and Pharisees and other cults that rose up, uh, took over the priesthood, ran them out, and basically that's the history that starts off in Matthew, where you've got all these different divisions. But they're the ones that kept the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are the proper interpretations of Scripture, the commentaries on the prophecies, the writings from the school of the prophets, and, and the like. Excellent. You start the book off with uh, Zadok history and Zadok uh, beliefs. Can you give us um, the, the, some of the background on the Zadokites? Yeah, basically they said that uh, apostasy was supposed to form, uh, which involved the calendar and the rituals and the belief systems. Uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees started teaching there was no Holy Spirit. The Messiah was just a man. There's no virgin birth, etc., their records from the School of the Prophets indicate the exact opposite. So they basically said that's a lie, we're not going to have any part of it. And they were persecuted, hunted down, and exterminated for the most part. Um, and so they picked up and they moved to uh, uh, Egypt and created a small temple and complex there. Uh, Egypt didn't care what you worshipped as long as you paid taxes, so that was fine. Uh, but to the north, you had to convert to, Judy, uh, to uh, Greek philosophy or die. That's where we get all the uh, stories about the Maccabees and that kind of stuff. So they were told, they actually said that they had a Christophany and, and were able to pull everything together. And they were told to wait there in Egypt until uh, the prophecy of Daniel was fulfilled that Rome would step in. And that would basically fix the assassinations and that kind of stuff. And then they were to go back into Israel and uh, one from their order would be the one to uh, usher in the Messiah, the prepare the way of the Messiah, of which John the Baptist said he was that one. Yeah, it's it's really interesting how all of this connects with, uh, you know, biblical accounts that we're all familiar with, but it really helps shed some light and, and, and give a broader context to what's really going on. Um, what is the Damascus document and why is that so important? Uh, the Damascus document 
is probably the main document as to what they believed and why. And most people just kind of skim over it because it's like, okay, if you're in a scene, you wear this, you eat this, you know, we don't care. But it's not so much that as it is why they did what they did, what they believed about it, what the Holy Spirit told them to do and how the apostasy formed. It's more of a history and theology put together. And so for our time period, it's really important because they said that several things go in cycles. So the end, um, the end times of our t time, right before the second coming, would be very similar. And so they give real good practical advice on what to do and what not to do. Excellent. Um, the Damascus document in your book, it's split up into uh, four parts. I'd, I'd love to uh, go through some of these. Let's start with the first, history. Uh, what does it teach about the history of the Zadok order? Uh, basically that they were the original priests and then factions arose, much like if you and I said, if you're a Baptist and I'm a Calvary Chapel, it'd be like, well, we do things a little differently, but we're Christians. It doesn't really matter. But there are other people that come up and they'd be part of a full-blown cult, but they claim to be Christian too. And so it's that kind of a deal. I mean, you can debate on how the prophecies are going to unfold, but you have to follow like Mosaic law for them. And so the cults arose, they changed the calendar system. Um, it got, it, it talks about how all of Israel was walking in madness in that last set of years. Uh, basically, the Sadducees said that we're the real guys, we're the ones that are supposed to run the government, so if you hold your fork wrong on Sabbath, it's a capital offense, we have to kill you. And then the Pharisees were saying the same thing, and the you know, all these different groups always trying to kill each other for stupid things. They lost their ability to govern. And so that's basically what happened. But the prophecies are pretty interesting. The theology part is that they have always believed that the Messiah would be God incarnate. He would come to pay the penalty for our sin nature, which would reconcile us to God. And that event happens one Shemitah after the end of the ninth Jubilee of their uh, age. Uh, which for our calendar is 32 AD, you know, give or take a year, but still they had it all pinpointed. And there's lots of other prophecies uh, given in those things, like uh, uh, the veil of the temple would be ripped in half when the true Messiah dies. And so there's a whole lot of different things in there, but the basic theology is what the patriarchs taught. And Moses said the same thing, or the Old Testament does, it's just that the cults had reinvented everything. So the, the theology is amazing. Um, and it's really, it's really important because not so much to us, because we look at the New Testament and go, yeah, we knew all that. But the Jews today who are told to stay away from Christians because it's all made up are learning that their great, great grandfathers believed much the same. And it's really interesting because if the oldest text have a Christian theology, maybe there's something to it. And there's actually a lot of people now that are, um, a lot of Jews that are becoming messianic. That's phenomenal. And to me, that's one of the most important things about the Dead Sea Scrolls, especially for uh, our day and age when we're, I mean, it seems like you turn on the news channel every day and, you know, some prophecy is being fulfilled again. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, time time's getting short and it's good that this stuff is coming out now. The, the next section that you have um, concerns the priestly laws for Israel. What, what can you tell us about those? Uh, basically, the, they were similar. Um, what, what is I think is really interesting is uh, the Sadducees would only talk to Sadducees. If you're not part of our denomination, you're trash. Pharisees, on the other hand, would talk to anybody who's Jewish. All Jews are brothers, but, but Gentiles are trash. And the Essenes had a completely different look. It's like, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, Jew or a Gentile, if you want to believe in Messiah and want to study the prophecies, your brothers and sisters. Now, when they're on duty to do temple rituals, no one can touch them or, you know, talk to them or anything because they're doing a ritual. So they believe that they had to continue to fulfill the law of Moses to the letter until the age of grace started. And so they were very careful to do that kind of thing. But it's interesting to, for them to talk about the idea that, you know, Holda was a prophetess, so there's always exceptions. So it's the Holy Spirit picks whom he wants, when he wants, how he wants. And we serve the Holy Spirit. We don't serve the temple priesthood. And it's really interesting to see there's a whole lot of history of the things that they talked about. Supposedly, they talk about a, um, 
a prophetical timeline in Jubilees and Shemitahs uh, on who did what and what was going to happen all the way through the time period. Uh, they talked about how there are multiple ages and there should be 7,000 years of time between Adam's creation and the creation of a new heavens and a new earth. Now we can speculate on that being real or not, but they were known by Josephus and all the other historians to be 100% accurate prophets and healers. And so what's interesting about it is all the extra biblical prophecies and then the commentaries on like the minor prophets that we have from them all point to what's happening in Rome at that time and they seem to be 100% accurate. So a good 80% of it deals with first coming stuff, but there are things in there about the second coming. So I would assume that would be very important for us to know. And some of the practical terms are the idea that, you know, in a time of light, you go out and witness, and if somebody gets mad, who cares? But in a time of darkness, that's dangerous. Think of communist China. You, you get yourself killed. So there's ways to witness and ways not to. And sometimes you have to pull away from society to protect your family, to live godly and, and things like that. And they give a lot of wise, really interesting points of their theology. There, there's actually whole things, when you go through the New Testament and look at Paul's writings, for instance, he talks about the gifts of the Spirit and uh, things like that. Those lists are almost identical in the, uh, in the Damascus Covenant. So the same concepts of what Paul taught, I just think it's really fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, you have uh, priestly laws for camp dwellers as well. How does that compare and contrast with the uh, previous uh, priestly laws? Uh, well, basically the idea was <clears throat> you can be uh, a Zadok priest and do priestly stuff, uh, much like you could be a Levitical priest and be a Pharisee or Sadducee or whatever. Paul was a Pharisee, but he was, he was of the tribe of Benjamin, so he couldn't do any priestly stuff at all. So the same kind of thing applies. You and I would believe in the Essene theology instead of Pharisee or Sadducee, uh, but we wouldn't be priests. We would probably live in the cities, have wives, children, uh, families, businesses, think, just normal people. Um, and then other people would try to go out to the countryside to live a more sheltered life, to do priestly things. And then in a time of intense persecution, uh, there were large encampments for protection, and you would, you would come out there. Uh, one, of the, one of the laws of the Essene order is that you always carried a weapon, a uh, short sword usually, but so if someone was, no one was foolish enough to attack an Essene encampment. Um, but they got along with the Romans well. Uh, if you went into a city, they didn't really need weapons there because Rome was there. But out in the country, you got to be careful. So it's it's interesting. It kind of makes me wonder when Jesus went out in the into the wilderness area and fed and talked to the five thousand. Where was he at exactly? You know, and was it major Essene people? Or we know there's Essenes and Pharisees and and Romans and stuff there. But pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, it's it's cool to look at that. Like sometimes. Jesus just walks into a town and all these people get converted. And then other times it's, you know, he says all this stuff and he can't, he can't seem to make headway. And it's like, well, that's because those ones that were easily accepting of him were most likely a scenes that knew the prophecies and knew what to look for. So it, it, it all, it all fits together. Um, lastly, mm -hmm. you have uh, the fragments of priestly laws. And there's some really interesting things in here um, concerning even stuff like gender fluidity and even prophecy. Uh, what can you tell us about these fragments? Um, they're hard to figure out exactly, but it, one thing is really interesting is the, the words that they use. And it's the same words that Paul uses, but they half the time, and probably would completely if we had the whole thing, uh, explain the definitions. So for instance, to me, when I read the scriptures and it talks about you shouldn't hold a grudge, to me that means you made me mad and I'm just not going to talk to you. Well, that's not a grudge. A grudge is you need to be executed and I don't want anybody to know I'm doing it. So I will wait a while. And then when we're in a dark alley somewhere, you will disappear. I'm holding the grudge for a time. It's a much more serious thing. Um, and so it's interesting they, they talk about like the Sabbath starting and they make it very clear. The Sabbath starts on Friday night, the sixth day of the, of the week at sundown. 
and they mention it's when the, the, the widest part of the sun, which would be the diameter, is right on the horizon. And so they give descriptions on this, exactly how to figure out the Sabbath and the rituals and things like that. So it, it's, it's interesting to look at all those things. A lot of it is practical. A lot of it has to do with us. They had rules like, for instance, we don't lie to each other. We always respect each other and no foul word comes out of our mouths, period. And that's not between you and me, that's just between me and God. This, this is a very serious covenant that he's told us to do. And so uh, it's really interesting to see all that. Yeah, definitely. Um, next we have the community rule. Uh, what is the community rule and how does that compare with the Damascus document? Community rule is, is more of the so the Damascus document is more of the history, what the Holy Spirit told them to do, more of the theology. The community rule is more of uh, the specifics on how to do different things. But it's not just do's and don'ts. They have things in there like, for instance, when you enter a camp, there is a guy called the inspector. You know, it's kind of like the, the head, head priest or whatever. But he would come to you and talk to you and realize that you have a musical talent or you have a prophetic talent or whatever. He would find out what your spiritual gift is, and he would set you over here in the corner with other people that have the same spiritual gifts that you do, you know, and things like that. And he would make sure that people are following directions. Uh, he would be the counselor and different things like that. There's a whole lot of things like that. They had a series of herbal medicine guides. Um, they were known to live to be 120 was their normal lifespan, whereas an average person lived to be about 60 back then. So they were known to be faith healers also. They would pray. Um, so there's just a whole lot of very practical things in there. But the community rule, the Damascus covenant, and then 4Q um, instruction, I think are actually all pieces of the same thing because it, it sounds like it. It's that kind of instruction. Not so much on prophecy, although there's a good amount of prophecy in it. That's really interesting. Um, we also get a lot about uh, human nature and you know, spirit versus the flesh stuff in part one of the community rule. What does this document teach and how does it compare with like our Christian beliefs? Uh, pretty much the same. In, um, I think it's First uh, John, he talks about um, the spirit of truth versus the spirit of error. That's what it says in King James. And it actually is more spirit of truth versus the spirit of deceit. And they use the same exact phrases in there. Um, they would talk about the spirit of truth versus the spirit of deceit being the fruit of the spirit versus the works of the flesh. But it's interesting that words are, the phrases are always different. Paul says it's the fruit of the spirit. They would call it the foundation of the spirit. Rather than fruit, it's almost like the roots. I mean, you can't really grow unless you've got the basic stuff down is, is their kind of a concept. And um, again, the lists are almost identical with the same kind of things. So you can pull Peter... Uh, Paul and, and James and John together, and the same basic concepts are taught, which makes most of us uh, think that John was in a scene. Uh, do we know John the Baptist was? And so it's really neat to see that all that together. The, to me, it's amazing that the theology is the same. We would only want to use the New Testament as our rule and guide of faith, and we judge everything by the New Testament. But when you look at these things, and they're so far 100% accurate, and the Pharisees are pretty much 100% wrong, uh, it pretty much tells you what's going on back in the, the 400 silent years. Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> part two deals with a number of things, including um, <clears throat> how they accepted new members. Do we see this kind of thing in the Bible anywhere, potentially, maybe even with Paul? Um, a little bit, yeah. Uh, Paul, uh, the, the membership concept is that they need to prove themselves. And I think one thing we do wrong is someone comes into our church and we have an altar call and they get saved. They say they're a Christian and so we baptize them and make them part of the community. And I guess for safety in America right now, it doesn't matter. But in communist China, again, it's an example of a life versus death type situation. So you need to pretty much prove, and it'd be easy to do if you are a Christian, we just need to watch you for six months and see if you're serious. Everybody makes mistakes, but you'd be serious in that respect. And uh, that's the, the entire concept, I think, that's given. Um, one of the things that they did was 
um, you, you became part of, they watch you. And then if you say you're a Christian and you become part of the order and they baptize you into the order, then you have like a one year, like almost like a trial thing. You don't go in, you don't give your opinion, make decisions. You learn the ways that they do things, eat the food that they eat, live their lifestyle. And then if you still want to proceed, you can. It's like not everybody's supposed to be a deacon or a pastor, but if you're going that direction, you need to go through some training and you need to follow directions. I think it'd be a lot easier to follow directions when you knew somebody was a 100% accurate prophet as opposed to, you know, somebody that doesn't know what they're doing. So it's really interesting to see that, the, the idea of the prophecies being given. One of the things I thought was neat was in as, as far as the gifts of the Spirit are concerned, anciently, the Pharisees said the gifts of the Spirit had ceased. And the Sadducees said, no, we practice them every day. And you can kind of see, well, if you're a cult, I could see the Holy Spirit not working through you. But then you get to the first century, and evidently the Essenes were right because the gifts of the Spirit function in the first century. We see that through the book of Acts. But then you get to a certain place, and most Christian groups today would say, well, the gifts stopped working. Well, in some churches, they still work. So we're kind of in the same boat again. It's like, Maybe the Lord's doing something. Maybe they didn't for a while. It's all up to him. But if you consistently don't see the gifts of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit leading you, maybe there's something wrong and maybe it's something to investigate. Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. And it, it's it's so funny in studying this myself, just the parallels that uh, of, of the issues that they were dealing with at the time and what we're dealing with in our time. I mean, they mirror each other. And, you know, when you when you uh, learn about the calendar and, you know, the prophetic cycles and stuff like that, it makes sense. Um, so that, that, that kind of stuff's really interesting. Um, it also talks about the establishment of Qumran. And this gets into uh, the word Damascus, because we're not talking about Damascus and Syria here. Um, so how, how does this uh, document explain that? And what, what, what is the whole parallel Qumran, Damascus, uh, the, the whole naming? What, what's the whole story behind that? Okay. Well, there, there's a Damascus, Syria. And it means something in Arabic, but that's that's a completely other subject. And Paul did go to Damascus, and that's where he was almost, you know, executed. And they let him out of the the uh, side on a basket, and then where he had his blinded experience in this. But uh, Qumran was the area that they came back to after the establishment of a peace to um, prepare the way of the Messiah, and so that was their headquarters there for quite a while. But they named it New Damascus, uh, as to con contrast with the old Damascus. And Damascus, uh, if you break it up in Hebrew, uh, can be Dom, meaning blood, like Adam is red blood. Dom meaning blood, and Maske, which is like uh, an heir, or the castle of an heir, that kind of stuff. So calling this New Damascus, we're saying that this is the house of the blood heir. So they're actually saying that we follow the true Messiah, we recognize the prophecies, and when he comes, he will be accepted here. And this is the proper way. There's actually a piece in the Damascus Covenant that talks about, uh, well, two things that are really interesting. One of them is that they talk about one of the reasons for writing the covenant to begin with is to welcome our brothers and sisters from the age of grace into the kingdom. And I just think that's so cool. Some guy 20 centuries ago knew about you and me being believers, and he wants to say, you're Gentiles, we know that, you're still okay, and you're brothers, welcome to the family. And it's just kind of neat to see that. But it, talking about Damascus and everything, that whole concept, there is a place in there where they talk about the time when the Messiah actually came and preached in Qumran. And a small incident occurred. So it's really interesting to see the histories of that stuff. This is what's supposed to happen. This is what we're expecting. This is what happened, and this is our reaction to it. Mm. Yeah, that's 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 so interesting. Um, you have a section two on the priest and calendar rituals. What are the priest and calendar rituals? Um, basically, the the entire concept, much like we we understand, most of us understand that Passover pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah. And the logical assumption would be on Passover of some year is when the Messiah would probably be put to death and resurrect and in that area. 
Uh, but they talked about all the different festivals being pictures like that or prophetic. And one of the main things that they talked about, they, they actually have more prophetic dates than we do. There's the seven festivals mentioned in Leviticus. And there's actually uh, two more that are major ones for them, new wine and new oil. And we don't have the rituals to those. Otherwise, I think we would understand it perfectly. If you just Because if you have this, the Passover Seder, I don't need to tell you anything. Just go watch the Passover Seder. It will click. So it's just really amazing, the death, burial, and resurrection. So uh, one of the major things, though, is Pentecost for them. The whole concept is that on Pentecost, that's when God starts a covenant. And that's on a yearly basis. You go renew your covenant before the Lord. And then if and when he starts a new covenant, it'll be on a Pentecost. So they expected every Pentecost, everyone to come back and do the Pentecost ritual, which is kind of like rededicating yourselves to the law of Moses and to that time period. And they, they waited or talked about the fact when the age of grace come, there'd be a totally new ritual. The same with the Seder and stuff like that. But the idea of dedicating yourself, and when Messiah comes, you'll actually be able to, on a Pentecost, Enter the age of grace. It's a different covenant. And they actually go forward and say, when the kingdom occurs, the age of grace will be over, and you will be able to, on a Pentecost, enter the kingdom age. It's a certain ritual that, that will exist at that time. You know, and they talked about, they speculated on what it would be. But in their time period, they have, and it's in the Damascus covenant, a good half of the ritual, at least, on what they do, how they rededicate themselves how they promised to do, follow the law of Moses, the, doing the different things. Of course, they didn't expect Gentiles to do that or women to do that, but you could still enter a covenant because everybody has a covenant with God. So it's really neat to see that and to see that as a concept. Some of our Hebrew Roots brothers get kind of confused and think we have to do the rituals the way the Jews did them. It's God's law, and if not, we're, we're sinning. That gets back to that Pharisee idea. You're holding the fork wrong, so I need to kill you. That's what makes it a very, very spooky anything like that. You're a Baptist and I'm a Nazarene or whatever, therefore I need to like convert you one way or the other. That's just spooky. And that, that's where you get into that apostasy or the madness it talks about. Um, but it's pretty neat to see those things. And I wish I really wish we had more. I think if we ever do find the, the original rituals for all the festivals, it'll be very, very clear what all they point to. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> Next, we have a 4Q instruction, which uh, has a lot of uh, advice about, you know, living a good life under God. Uh, what does 4Q instruction teach? Uh, a lot of the same stuff. It talks about um, some of the practical aspect is like you don't go into debt. If you are in debt or have to for some reason, Work night and day to get out of debt. It's it's a pretty much a serious sin, uh, much like anything else. Don't don't give yourself to alcohol or women, you know, in an Ill illegitimate way. Um, just different things like that. Uh, one of the things I thought it was neat is like uh, you have a wife of your youth, you know, your your loved one, uh, your one and only, and it talks about study the prophecies with her. It's really important that you're on the same page. And, you know, and you're supposed to teach your kids. It's uh, your responsibility to make sure they're taught. And I think a lot of times that's where we fall down, and especially the idea of when you get toward the end of an age, things get dark. The, the uh, society gets evil. And so at that point, you can't really just send your kids off to school and think everything will be fine. Um, you don't necessarily have to homeschool but at least be on the school board, know what's going on, and if you need to, pull your kids out. Uh, that whole concept, it talks about how a lot of people in certain cities in Israel at the time that were getting pretty evil just simply picked up and moved to the country, planted their own gardens, lived out amongst other people that believed like they did. And the concepts were really clear. It's like if you stay in a city like that, like an inner city, your kids will grow up. They will fall in love with somebody. And that somebody will not be Christian, and now your kids, your grandkids are corrupted, and there's nothing you can do about it. So before that happens, make sure it doesn't happen. Very, very serious thing to do. And so the protection and everything, it's just, it's really interesting. The other thing that they talked about is the whole idea is that the food and the, the systems get bad. 
Um, and so you need to do the proper herbal medicine to live a long life. And there's lots of examples of Essenes in the New Testament. For instance, in uh, Acts, it talks about, uh, I think it's called Menin, but it's Menachem, who came and actually laid hands on the Apostle Paul. Well, it actually says there in Acts that this was the Menachem that was in Herod's court. Well, this would have been some 90 years before. He'd have to be at least 90 to 100 years old uh, to be even there to put his hands on Paul. And you don't see too many 90-year-olds that just think, ah, I'm an Antioch, I'll just hop on a donkey today and ride down to Jerusalem, you know. And so it's interesting to see the herbal medicine aspect. And I've been trying to figure a lot of that out. There's a chapter in here about Higgy. There's not much about it, but they have an herbal medicine guide handed down from um, Noah to Shem through Enoch and then on down. And uh, we're trying to backwards engineer some of these things. And we're getting close. We're actually, I've improved my health quite a bit by following that stuff. But there's just a lot of practical knowledge. I mean, health, um, staying away from things that would influence you in the wrong way. And so many times today we say, well, I don't have time to take care of my kids. I don't have time to homeschool. I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to do that. Well, you have to make it happen somehow. Uh, pick up and move somewhere where the school is a good school, you know, uh, or something. You know, it's just, there's, you, you can't go to 40 hours of school per week and one hour of church and think that no matter how good it is, it's going to fix all the problems. And it just doesn't work that way. But there's a lot, lot of practical. I love the business model. You know, and then the whole idea of studying with your family, the prophecies. That, yeah, that's so cool. And, you know, thinking about that, just uh, it, it really does parallel our world today. I mean, our, our food is all messed up. Our schools are just abhorrent, you know, most of them. And it's it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And, and so those parallels make a lot of uh, make a lot of prophetic sense. In fact, speaking of prophecy, there's also some prophecy in 4Q instruction. Uh, what, what does it say? Um, I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up, but there, there's actually quite a bit in there. Um, some of the stuff talks about, um, making sure to study the birth times. I always thought that was pretty interesting. And birth times of what? Well, we're talking about the Messiah and the times when the ages change, um, and, and those kind of things. I think it all hinges back again to the calendar because some of the things they talk about is that, a lot of the, pro there, there are like centuries that go by maybe and not even a single prophecy is fulfilled. But you get toward the end of an age and there's a lot of little prophecies, a lot of things that happen. Um, so like for instance, right now we're, we're waiting for prophecies to happen, but we've had a ton of them come since Israel's come back. And that's been 80 years, but before then we had maybe one or two every couple of centuries. You know, and then some 50 or better in the last 80 years. We've still got a, a ton of other prophecies, Psalm 83 and Damascus and, and Iran and things like that. Some of the things that's interesting here is that we've, this tells us the, the Dead Sea Scroll version, which is what's going on right before the New Testament. And then we study the New Testament, which gives us the main details we're interested in. And then if we study the really early church fathers, we get to see what happened because of all of that. And you can see how the language is, is used the same and their concepts are the same. And it's neat, there's a church father, Hippolytus, that gives a list of those people that ran the school of the prophets, which includes John the Baptist. Um, it talks about their schools and how things work. And it's interesting to see the names of the people and know that they wrote extra biblical books and then to see some of the, the hints or the quotes sometimes naming them, sometimes not, in the scroll. So it kind of helps you all pull it all together to see the before, the during, and the after the time of Christ. What an exciting time to be alive that, you know, we Gentiles in America 2,000 years later, like we have access to all of this stuff now. And uh, it, 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 it's super exciting. I, I love it. There's a lot of debate about the, uh, the identity of the teacher of righteousness. What is the significance of this term in the Dead Sea Scrolls? And who do you believe the teacher of righteousness is? They make it pretty clear. The teacher of righteousness was to arise with healing in his wings. He is the one to whom we look forward to. He is the Melchizedekian priest. He is the one who is God incarnate. There's just tons and tons of talk about that. The problem is you've got people that don't want to... Um, 
don't want it to say what it says. And sometimes it's fairly easy just to change a couple of words around. Uh, for instance, I keep talking about how it, it constantly refers to the age of grace starting after Messiah's first coming. I had a guy on a radio interview one time said, I have all the Dead Sea Scrolls in English, but I have them all, went through them all, and nowhere do they say anything about any age of grace. And yet you say it's all through there. Where are you getting this stuff? And I said, well, it probably depends on who's translating it. Age is an age or a kingdom. You, know, you and I know what grace is. It's an unmerited favor. So they're probably translating it kingdom of favor. So it doesn't sound Christian. And to my surprise, he said, oh, kingdom of favor. Oh, yeah, that's all through there. Oh, okay. So it's just like it all depends on how you translate it. So the teacher of righteousness, it's very clear. A lot of people say, well, that's probably the guy that started the group, you know, whatever. But in three separate places, it talks about the teacher of righteousness was put to death by the liar, the evil priest. And that event was approximately, give or take, but approximately 40 years before the destruction of the temple. Now that has to be 70 AD or 536 BC, you know, whatever temple we're talking about. So it's pretty obvious around 30, 32 AD, the teacher of righteousness was put to death because of a lying priest. And it goes on and talks about the fact that he is, you know, the Messiah. So it's really straightforward. I mean, if it's the, if it's the founder of the group, this guy's almost 400 years old. And that's not going to fly even by his seen lifespans. So we're obviously talking about the teacher of righteousness, the Messiah. There's two other places that talk about the teacher of righteousness. And they call him the, it, again, that's that translation. It's called the unique teacher of righteousness. Well, when you look it up, the word for it that's usually translated unique is, is yahad, which is only one. So technically, this is the only begotten teacher of righteousness. All teachers are begotten, but this is the only begotten son of God, in other words. So all the language is there, and it's pretty easy once you look at it from a messianic standpoint. Uh, but again, it depends on how you translate it. There's some regular Bibles, like New Testament Bibles, that are really, really bad. I ran into one a ways back. It was talking about how Mary, when the angel says, you're going to give birth to the Messiah, and she says, how can this be? I've never known a man. This one Bible was so bad, it actually said, how can this be? My husband and I can't have kids. <laughs> it's like, that, that's a, that just completely obliterates the entire thing, you know. But it, they talk about a virgin birth and stuff like that, so it's pretty straightforward. Mm. Yeah, you have a section in there too called uh, the Book of Time Divisions, and and this this topic's one of my favorite. Uh, does this have any does this have any uh, prophetic significance? Yes, it's supposed to be all prophetic. Um, everything in the, in Shemitahs and Jubilees. A Jubilee is a fifty year period, and that's broken up into seven sets of seven. So a lot of times they don't bother with the exact year or the year and the day, but it was in that Shemitah, the second Shemitah of that Jubilee is when this happened. And supposedly it has a lot of that stuff. There are actually, I believe, three segments of it. One that talks about the kingdom. So we know that's yet future. One that talks about pre-flood, Nephilim problems, things like that. Um, and then another one that just talks about the time of King David and a few things. So it's interesting to see that. And there's not a whole lot there of that. But it's neat to be told these things. So now we know there's a, there's a book of Hagi, the herbal medicine, which, you know, when we get sick, that's really important. Um, this prophecy book would be fantastic to have with all these dates in them. That would be cool. Some people have asked me, like 11Q13 actually gives us the, the date of 32 AD when the Messiah would come. Uh, cool thing about that, they say, well, do you think that they just got that from the Holy Spirit? Or do you think they got it from Daniel, Daniel chapter 9? Well, either way, it's the same. It's from the Holy Spirit. But it's kind of neat to see either one, they believe Daniel is Daniel. It's not made up by somebody in the Maccabean period. Really talked about 32 AD. Uh, and or they had confirmation through the Holy Spirit. So, or both, you know. So it's really neat to, to see all that come together. So the prophecy aspect is, is really amazing. There's a whole lot of prophecies about things that happen right close to the second coming. Um, not a whole lot, but there's a good amount. One of the, my favorites, though, they talk about a time, it's called a visitation. 
And I think it's neat because remember when Jesus said, if you had just known the time of your visitation, I could have gathered you like a hen gathers a check, a chick, you know. And so we look at that and we think, okay, visitation is just, you know, when he came, you know, we don't think about it as, no, that is a very specific term. It is a time when God moves on earth, period. And if everything's not right, you're toast. The visitation is something extremely serious. And you see that through the time periods. And so one of the things it talks about is at the end of each age, there is a, a visitation period where it's called a, a period of repentance, uh, persecution. It's a time to let those people have a second chance and see through us the Messiah. Some of them will repent, but at the end of that time period, there's destruction for those that don't accept the Messiah. And it talked about the end of the first age is 120 years, and I remember 120 years to the flood, but uh, 120 in, in, in Abraham's time. Uh, at the end of the age of, uh, beginning of the age of grace, right before the Messiah's first coming, it's supposed to be a 40 year period. And then before the kingdom age, with the Messiah's second coming, it's supposed to be a seven-year period. Now, again, did they get that from Daniel chapter 9, you know, the seven-year tribulation? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe Holy Spirit told them. But there's just a whole ton of those kind of things in there. But again, they no matter where they get them, they cooperate with the New and the Old Testament and just give us either the same thing we already know or more information. And it should be really uh, again, an amazing thing for our Jewish brothers and sisters to wake up and go, the Messiah did come to die for me 2,000 years ago, and I can still accept him. So, That's amazing. Um, can you give us some background, uh, just kind of how the Dead Sea Scroll calendar works, um, how, you know, what, what ages are, how, how their whole system of time works? Because I do have an announcement um, near, a little bit later about the Dead Sea Scroll calendar. But uh, can, can you tell us how you kind of pieced all that together, what it all means? And, um, and people can even find this online because you, you made a website about it, too. Yeah, our website is dsscalendar.org. Um, <clears throat> basically, we're trying to compare everything to a regular Gregorian calendar we all know about. The Gregorian calendar is based on when Jesus was here. So if, and I say if, it's 100% accurate, it would have been, this is 2023, it would have been 2023 years ago this year that Jesus was born. Now that, you know, may be off a year or two, whatever, but that's how it's dated. It's A.D. Anna Domini. Uh, the old calendar is A.M. It's from creation. And basically what they taught is that there's 7,000 years of time <coughs> excuse me, between the creation of Adam and the new heavens and new earth. And the last thousand years will be a millennial reign of, of the Messiah ruling from Jerusalem. Same thing is taught in Revelation. But they break it up into ages. Uh, there's three sets of 2,000 years apiece. Each age is called, there's an age of chaos, an age of Torah, and an age of grace, and then a kingdom age of just 1,000. But the same time period is broken up into 14 unas, or 500-year periods. And each 500-year period is 10 jubilees. A jubilee is 50 years. Each jubilee is made up of, of seven shemitahs, or seven seven-year periods, and then a jubilee year. And so that's basically how the system works. So a lot of times they'll say it was in the, well, like 11Q13, that date is given. The date would be the uh, first Shemitah, actually at the very end of the first Shemitah, after the end of the ninth Jubilee of the eighth Una. And that tells you perfectly exactly where you are in time. And so it's interesting to see that because they would date everything that way. And it seems to be very, very accurate. And so in the, in the New Testament, when Jesus did something, or John or, or Moses did something in the Old Testament at this date, and then it says five days later something happened, you instantly know the date you know the uh, whether it's a Sabbath or not, how close it is to a festival. All of a sudden, things kind of fit. And they have the same language throughout the New Testament, and you're supposed to know these things. Like when Jesus went to the wedding of Cana, it said it was on the third. The, the third of what? Well, you know, the third. You, you know, wedding, Cana, third. You know what I'm talking about. And we don't because we don't know that calendar. But that's plenty to know exactly what's going on. And I bet you 10 to 1 he does something with wine at that fe Feast of Cana, you know, and sure enough, he does. And so it's neat because they'll talk about how the world was created 
on the, or the sun, moon, and stars rather were created on the fourth day of creation week. So we call that Wednesday. It's the fourth day of the week. So New Year's is on Wednesday, and they have a 364 day calendar instead of a 365. And so that means it's divisible by seven days, 52 weeks even. So every New Year's is on a uh, Wednesday. Every Passover is Tuesday. Everything's always the same, so you can always calculate. You know, like when Daniel says the 1335, it doesn't fit on a modern Jewish calendar, but on the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, it's perfect. It's really easy to figure. So you can figure out those kind of things. So it's neat to see that consistently. And so um, the years are there, all that stuff. The one thing that confused us for the long time was if we all know, no matter it's a 364 or 365 day calendar, there's something left over. So somewhere along the line, we have to have a leap something because on a calendar, you have to have a full day. So it's just, yeah. so what was their leap system? And uh, we have whole calendars in the Dead Sea Scrolls of five and six years before they start over. So that shows us, and then they have moon phases on some of those. So it shows us there's no leap day or two or whatever every single year. They don't do anything with leap months. And so at the end of every fifth or sixth year, uh, that would be just enough space to do a leap week. And again, that would keep the Sabbaths in sync because Sabbaths are very, very important. And so we finally figured that out. I didn't. The guys at the University of Tel Aviv did that. And then uh, finally, we were able to pull it all together three or four years ago. And it's a very fascinating calendar, and it's very simple and seems to be very prophetic. Yeah, definitely. When I was uh, researching for my book, uh, The Lost Prophecies of Qumran, I took that calendar and all the way from Genesis to Revelation, it fits, you know. And I mean, I've been obsessed with prophecy ever since I was a little kid. Like, I'm just, oh, especially the book of Revelation. I just always loved it. Mm -hmm. um, and But I could never make sense of... Uh, the day counts and 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 because and, uh, they just don't fit on any other calendar but it's like finally with this calendar it fits beautifully and it, it answers a lot of questions like uh you know for example <clears throat> there's kind of a debate going if if the two witnesses come in the first half or the second half of the tribulation well with that calendar you can piece it all together and show it it has to be uh the first half and especially when you attribute that somewhere in that time period, because it's it's seven years, there's going to be a leap week, and um, you know pe I pieced that all together in, in in the book and showed that hey I think this answers it you know it, it would have to be in the first set, which for a lot of other reasons makes more sense anyway, um, but yeah I, I the the discovery of this this calendar system, you know so far like in 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 my ministry it's been the most exciting thing and uh, and I I just absolutely love it. Can I say one other question about the calendar? Um, I thought it was pretty neat as far as the prophecy goes. Sometimes you'll you'll look at the AM calendar or BC, and it'll be so many days between this event and that one, and it doesn't doesn't appear to be anything. It's just kind of random. When you look at Shemitahs and Jubilees, though, all of a sudden you see all sorts of parallels because of the way it comes out. And someone pointed this out to me the other day. I thought it was interesting. Um, the on just on the Dead Sea Scroll calendar. Uh, this last war, when Israel started, it was uh, October 7th, I think. It was that Saturday morning. Well, the Friday night, Saturday morning is the Sabbath. So it's the 17th of uh, Tishrei is what it was. Um, so anyway, we're looking at that, and uh, we're, we're going through backing up, or the 17th of the month. Um, so anyway, it was October 7th is what it was. But I went back and looked it up on the same calendar, the Yom Kippur War was actually on the same day. Now, it's not on the modern Jewish calendar, and it's not on the Gregorian calendar, but it is on that one. And so I started looking it up. Is there anything else that happened on that day? Which, again, wouldn't exactly fit unless you're using that calendar. And it, it's the day that the ark landed on Mount Ararat. You know, and you had to take the a long time for the waters to recede. So what the ark has to do with a war, I don't know. Maybe that part is a coincidence, but it's interesting to see that. It's I don't think two wars, major wars like this, starting on the exact same day is a coincidence. But you'd never see that if you're looking at the Gregorian or the modern Jewish calendar. 
it's so interesting. I, I, yeah, I, I didn't know. I, I actually, I've been so busy. I haven't, uh, I haven't compared that with the calendar. But that, that is so. That, that's really interesting. Yeah, I think that's more than a coincidence as well. Um, you, you mentioned the book of uh, Hagi. How much of that do we actually have? And do you think that there's other fragments out there, or there are other pieces that we might, we might find sometime in the future? I think so. Um, the Damascus Covenant itself was fairly intact, but there were some major holes in it. And there was a piece that was found at the Geniza in Egypt, um, and that was perfect, perfectly preserved. Of course, nobody looked at it because they, 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 it would be dated Middle Ages, but that's, you know, so it's at least Middle Ages. So pulling all those together, there's things all around the planet where there's all these different scrolls. There's, some, there's several thousand Hebrew scrolls down there in Egypt uh, and several other places that haven't even been cataloged yet. So it, who knows what's going to be there. Um, and just because they're medieval, we've got to remember the oldest copy of the Bible we had was medieval until, you know, 11th century, until the Dead Sea Scrolls came along. So very, very important. But the Book of Hagi is the herbal medicine book. It's talked about a lot all the way through the scrolls. Uh, very little, if any, is given to it except little references here and there. They, they'll mention, for instance, that they do intermittent fasting. They'll mention that they eat the Passover lamb, so they're not vegetarians. Uh, they'll mention that they, they drink the wine, so they're not, you know, they, they do that. And different things like that. So we've been able to figure out that they did a lot of fermentation, not necessarily alcohol, but fermenting the herbs to keep them. Like, for instance, today, if you, garlic is probably the, one of the most potent antibiotics that doesn't have side effects. If you ferment it in honey, it gets even stronger. You know, so just little things like that. You can do these home remedies, and a lot of it's been around for a while. But uh, a lot of it hinges on anti-inflammatory foods. And some of the things that I've noticed, for instance, John uh, lived a long, long life. He died in the, in the, according to church history, in the time of Trajan. So he had to have been well over 100 years old. And 100 to 120 is normal for an Essene. So, but that tells me one thing. The basic idea for a Christian is you go out to the Gentiles and you make disciples and you eat what's set before you and you don't ask questions, right? So if you're eating their food and they only live to be about 60 on their food and you eat their food with them to be a brother, but somehow you still live to be 120, it's got to be supplements. You know, maybe it doesn't matter how many potatoes you, you eat, but you've got to have some other supplements with that. So the, the whole idea of it being fermented, the herbal medicine, the anti-inflammatory, things like that. I've, I've been experimenting with uh, several things to lower my blood pressure. And um, um, I, I probably, you know, am all stopped up for eating hamburgers all my life, you know. So apparently I've gotten that fixed. As a side effect, this, the same herbs have completely wiped out my allergies. Um, I, I used to be deathly allergic to walnuts. You give me a walnut throat swells up, I probably have to go to the hospital. Now I accidentally eat one and don't even notice it. Matter of fact, as at the conference, uh, you, I think you guys were going to be there, but Tom got sick. So at the Prophecy Watchers conference, uh, we went in one of the dinners and they had uh, German chocolate cake and lemon cake. Well, the, the German chocolate cake has got nuts in it, so I'm just going to grab the lemon cake and eat it. Who would ever put walnuts in lemon cake? <laughs> Nobody does that. But they did, you know, and I took a bite and it didn't bother me. And I thought, well, uh, this has happened two or three times now. I'm just going to try it. I ate the whole cake. Well, the piece, just one piece. But it um, didn't bother me. And so it's really interesting. It's apparently what happens is that you, you get a histamine reaction and then you swell. And then you get a bad histamine reaction and then it's dangerous. Well, if you can't swell, I still have the allergies. But if I can't swell, nothing happens. So it's some people have that kind of a prob, uh, thing and some don't, but it's just interesting to see. It depends on how healthy you are. I mean, if you have diabetes or other stuff, it's going to be harder. But uh, they 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 talked about how not being overweight is one thing that being overweight shortens your lifespan. So there's all these different ideas, and then there's pieces of things that they have, and we're trying to kind of piece them all together. One thing that helped was that the uh, one of the copies of this document, Hagi, would have been uh, Shem's. 
Now Shem's great-great-great-grandson was Shun, the Yellow Emperor, who produced the Chinese Herb Classic. So that has to be connected with it. And that helped us to go back and look at some of these things and kind of see how they fit. And uh, they talk about earth dragons, enzymes, for instance, and it's the same kind of stuff. So we're, we're beginning to piece it back together, I think. And I, it's, it's helping a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. We, my uh, my wife's a holistic health practitioner, and um, she's. I mean, even just with me, I mean, she's uh, changed a lot of things in like my supplements and diet and stuff. And I, I've seen a lot of benefits of it too. It's, it's, it's really, uh, really powerful stuff. You know, God's given us all the medicine that we need. <laughs> but um, well, we discussed a lot, but in reality, we have barely scratched the surface of the content in your book. Uh, what would you want most for people to take away from our conversation tonight? Um, well, as far as this book goes and the Dead Sea Scrolls in general, uh, they were healers. They were 100% accurate priests, uh, prophets. <clears throat> the concept of prophecy and theology is identical with Christianity. There's one God who somehow manifests as three persons. The Messiah is God, but he's not the Father. Um, he died for your sins almost 2,000 years ago, the date they have listed. Um and according to the scrolls, no matter who has lied to you about this, you have the ability to accept Messiah. He still loves you and wants you to be saved. And you have the ability to accept him. And so many people are thinking about it, looking at the New Testament, seeing if it fits with the Old Testament, seeing what the scrolls say, and then basically accepting the Messiah, becoming Messianic. And this is, I believe, the fulfillment of what Paul says eventually all Israel will be saved. And I think we're entering into that time period. I think there's there's a prophecy in Isaiah 29 that clearly predicts the discovery of the scrolls and some of the things that happen. So for us that are believers, prophecy is cool. Uh, the little more information that we have pulls a few things together and we're beginning to really see some stuff now with what, especially with the war going on. But the fact that the, all these books and the scrolls that are accurately predicting the future all say the same thing, that we're destined for hell, not our fault, but we're still destined for it, and there is a way out. The Messiah loves you and wants to fix it, and so I would encourage everybody to do that, to really seriously think about it. Amen. Well, I really want people to pick up this book because it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, where can people get your book and where can they uh, follow you online? Um, I'm at uh, BibleFacts.org. Uh, we do a Monday night live stream on, uh, at 7 p.m. on YouTube, um, and then there's a few other things during the week. Uh, I have a bookstore on the website, BibleFacts.org. It's basically just links to Amazon, so you can go on Amazon and buy that stuff. Uh, so, so far we've written, I think I've written 34 books. Um, and the last five or six, I'll deal with Dead Sea Scrolls and that kind of stuff. And I just think it's fascinating to study. Uh, again, pulling the Church Fathers, the New Testament, and the Dead Sea Scrolls together, it really completes the story. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. And I should mention, too, I said that I had a, a brief announcement that um, as soon as I have a chance, I will be uh, creating the, the physical, the Dead Sea Scroll calendar for 2024. Uh, so for those that aren't familiar, Ken Johnson, like we mentioned uh, earlier in, the, in this episode, has expertly put together the Dead Sea Scroll calendar on his website, dsscalendar.org. And for the past two years, this next one will be the third, um, I put those into print format, and Ken and I have been making those available to you through uh, his website, BibleFacts.org, in the store, and my website, DailyRenegade.com. So very shortly, uh, definitely before Christmas, because they make great gifts, uh, I will update the calendars for 2024, and we will make those available in the same places uh, on our websites. And I'll also make an announcement when they're ready. So uh, make sure all of you out there watching, make sure you subscribe to us here and uh, turn on all notifications so, you, so you'll be notified when we upload something new. Uh, Ken, thank you so much for uh, joining us again on the Sharpening Report. This has been an uh, just enlightening, absolutely uh, phenomenal uh, discussion. And this stuff is just so interesting. I love it. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely have to have you back on again uh, sometime soon. Well, thank you. Anytime, anytime. And thank all of you for uh, joining us. Until next time, love you all, take care, and God bless. Now, I've always been passionate about bringing truth to the forefront, and now more than ever, our Christian community needs a platform to discuss these pressing issues openly. Um, there's no denying that we live in a time 
uh, when censorship quickly has become the norm. We've we've all seen it, you know. Voices silenced and crucial topics skirted around, uh, especially when they blend biblical truths with politics or current events. Um, but what if we could actually change that narrative, if not for the world, at least in our community here that we hold dear? Uh, and, and by community, I don't even mean your, your low, I mean our community here online, uh, you and me and everybody watching. So I mentioned before, I'm teaming up with my good friend, Zach Drew. Uh, many of you might remember him from the Jim Baker show. Zach's heart for the Lord and the gospel is immense. Yet despite his dedication, the limitations of working within a 501c3 uh, for the Zach Drew show, it, it, it's restricted the breadth of his message. Um, biblical truths and political events are directly relevant to our faith and we're compelled to avoid discussing these things. And th this is by other Christians. This is by Christians within the 501c3 construct. Um, that's where our vision for Daily Renegade uh, comes in. Now, Daily Renegade, it, it's not just another video streaming service. It's really a movement. It's a subscription-based video streaming platform combined with a vibrant social media community. So imagine being a part of a space where there is absolute freedom to discuss the Bible, politics, and current events without the looming shadow of censorship. And you get one place for everything. So you don't have to do YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, and you don't have to do all these. All of it is in one place. Um, and again, without censorship. Our dream is for Daily Renegade to host shows such as The Sharpening Report, which you're watching now, uh, The Zach Drew Podcast, which is going to be a new thing we'll be launching, Peck Perspective, which is an, uh, a show that I've been doing for the Paul Revere Report, but we want to switch it over, and uh, even more enlightening content in the future. So this is more than just entertainment. It's an opportunity for growth, connection, and really spiritual edification, which I think we all need. Uh, a lot more than we're able to get with our online communities. Because many of you say you can't talk about this stuff in your home church, so you have to go online or you have to go to conferences. Well, conferences can be expensive, and they're great, but they're expensive and they only happen a couple times a year. You, you know, you need something that you can go anytime you need it. Um, and that's what we're trying to make for everybody, uh, for, for, for all of you, for us and so we can all have access to that. So one feature that we're really thrilled about is the Renegade Report. And this is this will be a continually updated newsletter that's seamlessly integrated into Daily Renegade, right into the website. Uh, plus our envisioned community space will function like a blend of Facebook and Telegram, allowing all members to post, comment, and uh, truly connect with each other and with us. Um, also, our videos will come with downloadable PDFs that include the show notes for that episode, including content we just could not fit into the show. Um, but, you know, dreams and goals are great, and especially ones of this magnitude, but they require support. So to ensure that we offer the best experience and that this venture stands the test of time, uh, Zach and I need to raise $25,000, and this amount will cover the essential web development costs, uh, marketing, app creation, we are getting apps, we're getting phone apps for iOS and Android, and we're getting a TV app uh, for Roku, we want to develop all that, uh, and, and vital equipment for our brand new shows. So Zach and I have been blessed with the trust of many within the Christian media company. Uh, we, we are very familiar with uh, Christian media, this is, this is our our bread and butter, we know the space, we know the the good in it, and we know areas that definitely need to be improved. Um, and we wanna, we wanna bring all of that in. Um, we deeply believe that, and, and also we both have years and years and years of, of trust built into that community. So we, we deeply believe that Daily Renegade is our most effective way to serve Jesus Christ and the church in this age, in these end times that we're living in right now. And th this is our chance together to reclaim our voice in a world where it's increasingly under threat. So if you feel led, um, and pray about it, but if you feel led, please support this endeavor at givesendgo.com slash dailyrenegade. And even if you cannot contribute financially, your prayers for this uh, project are invaluable. With uh, faith and unity, we can pave the way for a brighter, uncensored future in Christian media. 
So that link again is givesendgo.com slash dailyrenegade, and you can find it in the description of this video below. If you've tuned into my YouTube uh, shows or anything Daily Renegade related, or, or even just read the signs of our times, then you know that we live in a season of undeniable economic instability. It is rough. We're all feeling it. Now, while I firmly believe in the promises of the Lord, I also recognize the importance of being responsible stewards of the resources that he has blessed us with. Now, in Revelation 6, the Black Horse prophecy speaks of times when economic hardships will be absolutely rampant. And while some may see the troubling economic indicators today as only coincidence, um, they are actually potential birth pangs heralding this more significant Black Horse crisis. Now, I, I totally believe in the pre-trib rapture. And if you don't, that is totally fine. I'm so glad you're here. We love you. And, and I, I, this is something that I don't ever fight about. Um, and, uh, and people here at Daily Renegade don't fight about it either. Um, so if you're, if you're mid, pre, wrath, post, that is totally fine. We're all Christians. We all love each other. Uh, but I do believe in the pre-trib rapture. Um, but let's not forget, I, I do not use that as an excuse that we shouldn't be prepared. I'm not one of these, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get any, like, survival food or anything in case the grid goes down because, you know, my, my hope is in the Lord's promise that we're going to be out of here before then. Well, let's not forget, like, let's pump the brakes here. Let's not forget that believers, Christians, still lived through the Great Depression. No rapture saved them from those trying times. There have always been famines, and there have always been times of plenty. And that, that there's no saying that that's going to go away. Uh, so we do need to be prepared. We are in an economic downfall right now, and we need to protect what God has blessed us with. We need to be good stewards with what we have. We need to store up for the drought, for the famine. So... Our responsibility is not only to await Christ's return, but to wisely safeguard God's provisions for ourselves and for our children and grandchildren while we are still here because we do not know when he's returning. So this brings me to a significant point about our current financial system, currency versus real money. Uh, now, while widely used, our dollar is just a currency subject to inflation and the whims of global markets. It's easily manipulated. It's not real money in the way that God-given silver is, you know, things that God gave us. Uh, so to illustrate, if you kept $1,000 in cash since the late 1960s, say you took uh, $1,000, you put it under your bed, now inflation would have eroded its purchasing power drastically. You would have $1,000 today, but you won't be able to buy as much with that $1,000 today than you could have back in 1960. Now, here's, here's the difference. If you had invested that $1,000 in silver in the 1960s during that same, that, that same period, if you said, okay, I got my, my stack of, of $100 bills here, I'm going to go buy some silver, and you put that under your bed or in a safe or wherever, today that would be worth $28,000. Amazing. So it retains the purchasing power of the time that it's in. Now, th this is the power and stability of actual assets like silver, our, our God-given uh, precious metals. God gave us this stuff for a reason. God didn't necessarily give us dollar bills, but he gave us silver. He gave, a, he gave us gold. And, you know, there's some issues. There, there's still some issues with, with gold, just with, with markets and things. Um, uh, so for, for, for me, I, I think, I mean, you can by all means go for gold, but I think uh, silver is, uh, for me, just a little bit more safe and stable. Um, not anything to do with the metal itself. It's just there's been times in the, in the past where the government has confiscated gold and it's been a whole ordeal, but there's a protection on, on silver. Um, anyway. Uh, so how can we make a wise choice in these uncertain times? Well, we do. We can do that by converting uh, your savings, your retirement funds, 401ks, anything that you have saved, your assets, into silver. And there's even a discreet, a discreet way that if you want, you can get this metal shipped to your doorstep or you can have it protected in a secure facility uh, provided by the same people supplying you with the silver. And more fascinating 
is that many don't realize they can convert their IRAs or 401ks into physical silver, and that totally avoids the pitfalls of this volatile fiat system that is vulnerable to hyperinflation and is getting worse by the day. Now, of all the choices available, there's really only one company that I've entrusted with, with my personal investments in this regard, and it is, it is our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is a Christian-led uh, place, the Christian-led Cornerstone Asset Metals. Now, I've experienced their integrity and expertise firsthand throughout the years, and I believe that when the storms hit our economy, those of us who chose to invest in silver through our Christian brothers and sisters at Cornerstone will stand firm. They treat this as a ministry. While technically on paper, yeah, it's a business, but they treat this as a ministry. They are here for the church. They are here for you, they're here for me. They know what's coming. The economy's collapsing. It's really, we're, we're in really bad shape and anything that you have, you would be wise to invest in something stable such as silver. So for your sake and for your family's sake, uh, I urge you to visit cornerstoneassetmetals.com. Again, I have worked with these guys for years. They are top notch, and this is why I do not uh, endorse a whole lot of things on this channel. You know, I don't, I don't take, I, I do get a lot of offers. I do get a lot of people saying, hey, will you promote this product on your show? I get that a lot, and I, I, I say no to 99% of them. Because for one thing, I need a few years to be with a company and work with them to see how they are before I'm gonna subject you guys to it. Because if I don't, you know, what if they're scammers? Yeah, I, I can't you know, I can't do that to you guys and, and I don't want to do it to myself, but you know, I, I feel that the Lord has put a responsibility on me towards you guys. And, um, I, I need to know at, at least as best as I can, that the people I'm suggesting or the companies that I suggest or the ministries that I suggest are trustworthy. So that's why I don't promote a whole lot of, of, uh, companies or, or even other ministries or anything like that on, on the show, you know, outside of like interviewing somebody for a book or something. But when it comes to something this heavy, I just don't do it. But with Cornerstone Asset Metals, I have been working with them for years. If there were any red flags, I firmly believe they would have come up by now. They are really good brothers and sisters in Christ. They have taken care of me uh, really well with my when I invest with them. Um, and by the way, we've even worked together so closely that if they wanted to, they could have ripped me off pretty easily. And they are just not that, <laughs> like at all. I can't say the same for every other gold and silver company out there because I don't know. This is one I can say for as absolutely sure as I can possibly be on this side of eternity. They are legit. They are absolutely the real thing, and they will treat you right. CornerstoneAssetMetals.com. Click on the link in the description below this video, uh, and you can request your free silver report. So there's no, um, there's there there there's no. You don't have to promise to do anything right away. Uh, you, you know, just get a free silver report. They're not going to be pushy with you. They're going to talk with you, and they're going to see like what, what, what you, what your needs are. Um, they'll they'll help you. Um, and also, please remember to tell them that Josh Peck sent you. This actually does help out a lot uh, because it, it it tells them who of my audience uh, they have, and where people just come in just kind of out of nowhere. They really do prefer to work with uh, Christians because they can better help Christians because they are Christians, you know. Um, so tell them that uh, Josh Peck from Daily Renegade sent you. If you're doing it online, there's a little space, a drop down menu that you can click on that. That does help out a lot um, because we do work closely together. And um, and that does help me out too. So uh, their financial experts are ready to guide you and they're not pushy. I promise you, again, these are brothers in Christ. They're, they're not going to push you or anything, but they, they are ready to guide you on the best protective measures for your savings in these turbulent times. They are truly providing a ministry effort here in these prophetic times of economic collapse. So once again, Cornerstone Asset Metals, check the link below and tell them Josh Peck sent you. Let's be wise, prepared, and above all, trust in the Lord while being responsible stewards of the treasures he has granted us.